Now we can turn a bit more to the U.S. and look at ADP payrolls, what is happening at the hours work, small businesses, because there's there's a lot of problems that still are, are, are arising at the small business level. Now, we're not seeing that as much in the large corporations, but small businesses, which make up a large part of the U.S. economy, continue to be under pressure. So before we get into that, we'd like to say, please like, subscribe, share. You know, we appreciate your support and any ideas that you have for shows, anything that you think would be a good idea, please let us know in the, um, in the comment section. So just jumping into ADP payrolls. Now, uh, in the past, they've been pretty good at predicting where, uh, you know, non pharma and uh, you know, payrolls were going to come out. They've been uh, they've been off and they've been fairly under where those numbers have been, but here they they come in, they came in weaker again. So November ADP payrolls came in at three hundred seven thousand versus an estimate of four hundred thirty thousand, and four four hundred four in prior months, which was revised up from three sixty five. Uh, the large business side increased 58,000, mid-size 139,000, small 110,000. Again, things that are good to see in terms of that mid-size and small, but we'll go and dig in a bit more. You know, Legion Hospitality had the biggest gains uh, with uh, 95,000, while information uh, weakest, just again, flat, just kind of where things are. But on the information or IT side, they, they didn't see the biggest drop. So to see the biggest increase in Leisure Hospitality makes sense versus the other two. But so when we look at just the, the general numbers, you can see that we still haven't made back those losses that we saw in April, which were 19. Uh, 0.5 million. And instead, we've been kind of trying to get back as much as we can. And here we only had 307,000. And just given based on the data that we're seeing going forward, it's going to be hard to see this right the ship because it's just slowing down. We're getting more um, announcements or extensions or expansions of uh, furloughs and uh, layoffs. And that's just going to put those those problems back, you know, f kind of front and center. Now, the Indeed data came out. Unfortunately, we didn't put uh, some of the information in this show, but we'll have it in next week. When we look at some of the Indeed data, they've gotten better. You know, the, the pace of uh, has slowed. Now we're only 12% off of last year, but it, it's really kind of flatlined where we're not seeing a new uh, increase in postings for jobs, even though we've come pretty hard off the bottom. We, the, the you know, from March, let's call it from April till about June, July, we had a very steady growth. The slope was perfect. And then in July, we really started to see things kind of level off and things go sideways. And now I think into the end of the year, we're going to see some of that slow down. And the reason why is when we look at change in business openings. So here you can see the change in business openings, mid-November versus mid-October using July as a data set. So again, when we look at July, things were great going into July, and then July was when things slowed. So how how did we do against July? And here you can see some of those slowdowns that that have continued with uh, six percent in education, you know, five point five percent nonprofit hospitality. You know, these are things that are going to continue to struggle, especially given the rise in cases and the lack of stimulus. PPP money has run out there is going to be a problem of trying to get the small business up and running again. And and now given the business cycle is there, you know, you can you declare bankruptcy, restructure, you can, you know, maybe start something new. Uh, you know, people will have an entrepreneurial a spirit of those that have maybe gotten laid off and want to try something different or follow a passion they've always had. So this is something just, it, it's, it's more transitory where we will come back from this. It's just, it's not going to happen overnight which is why I still am concerned about 2021 and just what those growth estimates really look like. Now, looking at this a bit differently, this we can look at the baseline and we look at you know hours worked. So hours worked, businesses open, employees working. So putting this all together, you can see that the business opening is obviously going down, pulling down, hours worked are declining, employees working, declining. Obviously, hours and employees are a problem because sometimes employees... You'll see that drop, but they'll pick up more hours. Instead, we're seeing more people go part-time where some people that, I mean, anecdotal, I've heard people going full-time to part-time or part-time of 0.5 to 0.2. And this data is really kind of confirming some of that anecdotal. And it's really on a global level, uh, on, a, on a national level, and it's using the baseline of July. So this isn't even going back to 
pre-COVID, this is going back to July, which was still down, and now we're, we're moving in the wrong direction as we head into the end of the year. Now, small businesses are closing, and how many of them are permanent? So home-based client firms open uh, percent change from Jan 2020. So this is looking at the January moves. And here you can see that the seven-day moving average has moved down. Obviously, this includes Thanksgiving, so you have to you know, excuse the fact that there's a drop. But look at, the, look at the, the rollover. So as we go into the end of September, things start rolling over. They accelerate, and, and they, we're starting to get lower highs, lower lows as we go into November, and then we get a steeper drop off. Now we will get some of this back, we will get a bounce back, obviously, people close for Thanksgiving, you know, this has 76.1% closed, I, you know, I, I've read that it was 70, you know, 78% of businesses closed uh, for Thanksgiving. So again, some of this will come back, it's just, it's not going to come back to the same level. Because people may say, look, I'm, I'm taking December off, you know, let's just shut it down, especially on the hospitality side, restaurant side, you know, re revisit in January. You know, these are things that are going to happen, which is going to keep this number well above, uh, well below where it was prior to Thanksgiving. And percentage of U.S. workers returning to the office. This is... This has implications in other areas as well, because not only are people not going back to the office, and you saw the steady the steady rise, you know, getting to about 30% into November, and now it's dropping off. Obviously, you have Thanksgiving, but when we look at the, the desire to go back and COVID cases rising, we think that we're going to head back. And again, we'll, we'll recover some of this, but we're not going to go back to the highs that we had coming into November just because... People want to work from home. They want to avoid exposure. But at the same time, people miss the office. So, which is why we're not going to go back to those March levels because people still want to go to the office, still want some semblance of normalcy, even if it's not five days a week, maybe two days a week, which is why we're going to bounce, but it just won't be back to those levels. And then there's some great charts in that we'll cover in terms of what you know, could happen going forward based on commentary from not only employees, but employers on working from home. Now, activity, uh, you know, again, activity remains our, our, the crux of what we use to really talk about where's oil demand, where's GDP demand in here. It's rolling over. So I'm not going not gonna, to, you know, hit this one too hard again just because we've talked about it so much. But you can see we're moving in the wrong direction heading into December and, and the, or I should say heading into Q1. And this is why I, I really think that people or the market is, is really painting a very rosy picture as we, as we head into, uh, into Q1 in January in general. And this is, I think, important as we talk about the small business index and kind of what's happening and how things are really shaking out on an aggregate level. Because the small business index, you know, has fallen to lows that we haven't seen. I mean, even going back to 2008, 2009, we're now below those levels. And the 12-month change is, you know, almost 4%. And the index is at 94.29. And this is looking at paychecks and employment to get an idea of, okay, what does that small business jobs index look like? And it's really moving in the wrong direction. And you can see that it typically, it, it fell really hard into 2019, into 2009 and then bounced. And the, and the problem is you can see the trend was, was down as we started in 2015. The trend has been moving in the wrong direction for an extended period of time. So when we look at the bounce back, you have to consider where does it bounce back to because we there was weakness coming in, there were problems coming in, and now here we are. So will it recover? Absolutely. It will absolutely recover. It's just it's not going to go back to 100. You know, does it go back to where we started of call it 97, 98? That's something that is going to that we're going to have to watch, especially as we go into December and then uh, Q1 of 2021, because this is going to be something to to think about when we're when we're looking at GDP estimates and what does strength look like as we head into uh, 2021 and beyond. Uh, interesting uh, some tidbits. So here we actually look at uh, just you know the over the overarching problem of COVID-19 financial impacts. You know, we have millennials, uh, major impacts. You know, we've shown this before. It just gives you an idea of, of spending. And as people in, get impacted and you see pain getting felt in different locations, we have to think about who is going to be the buyer, who's going to be purchasing. And as millennials are have more debt, have more issues, the, the major impact, this is going to 
be a an extended problem as we look at the consumer be, as we look at consumer behavior you know things that will will start to you know rear its head as as we move out and boomers become less you know gen x uh, you know becomes a bit less prevalent in the system and millennials are are experiencing the largest impact which is going to be a long a, a longevity problem not only because of spending but also what are the salaries look like what it, you know can they can they buy a home you know the home prices have increased exponentially obviously mortgage rates are at all-time lows but you have prices at all-time highs and obviously there's a correlation there so if rates rise does that bring down pricing so now you're you could be underwater you know there are a lot of things that we need to consider when we're looking at the financial impacts and what is that going to mean going forward as millennials you know don't have the discretionary cash that their parents brothers and sisters might have had and their grandparents as we come out of this uh this slowdown now the share of uh financial hardship i think is an interesting one as we look at the share of accounts and you know, things have gotten better since March, and you have to you have to think we did get stimulus. So as we got stimulus, people went out and they actually paid down credit cards, auto, personal loans, mortgages. You know, the, the trend has balanced out a bit when we look at uh, mortgage and credit cards and auto loans, personal loans. We think uh, you know it's con- has been trending and going con- to con- continue to trend in the right direction. Uh, mortgages is the one that I think is the is is slowing the most and. As we go into 2021 and we potentially get a lift of the moratorium on um, delinquencies, on foreclosures, you know, this is going to be something to watch closely as the others continue to, uh, to dwindle lower. Now, you know, in terms of aligned interests at work, you know, 98% of employees would like to work remotely at least sometime uh, uh, or some, at least some of the time for the rest of their career. And 82% of company leaders intend to permit working from home for a period of time. And this comes to the, to the, to the point of flex uh, schedules. You know, we're starting to see more and more about that two, uh, two in the office, three at home, three in the office, two at home. You know, I think you're going to see more and more of this blended schedule become a, uh, a bigger uh, component of just corporate and home work-life balance. And that's why the appeal of working from home uh, is, you know, where does it go? You know, when the COVID-19 crisis ends, where would you prefer to work on the average response? So again, looking from a different data set, you know, full-time at the office is about 7%. Mostly at the office is 10%. Equal mix and mostly remote. So I think the equal mix is the one that is going to get the most love. And, and I think we'll, we'll, get, we'll get the most support and buy-in from the business centers themselves. And this is going to be something to watch and something interesting as we go and, and as we start to factor in what does get, what does this do to gasoline demand? What does this do to diesel demand? What does it do to oil demand? Because if I'm working from home, I'm not driving as much, I'm not commuting as much, you know, what does that mean? Does that, does that shave things off? Because as we have seen people go from urban to suburban, which should mean more driving, but now you have people working from a home or remote more, does that offset the additional driving they'll do on the weekends because they won't drive as much during the week because they're going they're not going to be, you know, commuting to work. These are things that we're going to have to consider and talk about. And this is just kind of proving that point and showing and highlighting just migration from major urban areas. This is the shift away from the urban areas, Manhattan, Brooklyn, Chicago, San Fran. Yeah. And it's important to appreciate the movement from these areas is also tax revenue leaving. You know, we've we've seen um, Hewlett Packard talk about leaving, uh, moving their headquarters from California to Texas. You know, when we look at Connecticut, when GE moved, and you've seen other companies move from Connecticut, New Jersey. You know, others moving from uh, from California. That's tax revenue. You know, this is tax revenue leaving the state which has to be made up somewhere. And, and many of these states already have a very high uh, fiscal deficit and or spending on the state level. And how do you close that shortfall as you have people leaving the state, as you have companies leaving the state, which is just going to, to mean that spending is going to have to get cut, borrowing is going to have to increase or a mixture of both. And you're going to have to create some sort of incentive to move new businesses in to try to make up for some of that shortfall because the, the pressures will start to, to mount. And as you have those working remote, which means that maybe I'm working for a New York company, 
but I can live in Ohio or North Carolina or something that allows me a better quality of life without being the hustle and bustle and the, uh, you know, the, the expenses of New York, you know, these are things that are really going to have to, you know, do a deep dive, you know, we, we continue to look at it and, and try to see, okay, well, are we seeing an uplift from gasoline demand? Because people are, have already done this. People have already left Manhattan. Like this has already happened. They've already purchased cars. Look at us used car sales, you know, used car prices, you know, new car sales. Everybody's bought cars, but yet we're seeing declines in additional in gasoline demand. So how much of that comes back? How much of that normalizes? And these are things that are going to be continuous questions over the next few years. And one that we're happy to opine on as as we look at our daily activity numbers and the, de- the general activity, uh, you know, not only just in the U.S., but also throughout the world. <laughs>